Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Vancouver Foundation Annual Review. My name is Kevin McCourt, and I'm the President and CEO of Vancouver Foundation. Thank you for joining us today. This is the second version of this update that we've held due to COVID on webinar. They used to be held in person, but with a much smaller audience, and we're glad that so many of you were able to join us today. Today, we're going to share our reflections from the past year, as well as some insights into where we're heading. But first, for some housekeeping items, for accessibility, we've arranged automatic live closed captioning of this event. If it's not already turned on, anyone that would like to enable a feature can click on the button along the bottom of your screen that says live transcript. You can choose to display this feature in the chat box or on screen. The event will be recorded and registrants will receive a link to the recording following the event. Participants are also welcome to enter questions in the chat throughout the event or follow through our post event survey and our donor services staff will follow up with you after the event. I will shortly introduce Tatalia Michelle Nahani, who will be offering a territory a welcome. But before I pass the spotlight to her, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the lands where I am today. I'm fortunate to be joining this webinar from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil -Waututh peoples. I'd encourage each of you to reflect on your location and acknowledge and give thanks to those who have cared for the land where you are today. At Vancouver Foundation, Whenever we open an event, we encourage the host to go beyond a simple land acknowledgement that you often hear at events like this by sharing something that you've recently learned about the lands where you work. In that spirit, I'd like to share a story that was in the Taiyi last week about the Indigenous master horticulturalists who built flourishing communities throughout this region. Dr. Chelsea Armstrong, an Indigenous Studies Assistant Professor at Simon Fraser University, just published a study in the Ecology and Society Journal in it, she documents four sites across BC that are ecologically more diverse than the conifer forests that surround them. And the reason? Each is on an indigenous reserve and marks the site of an ancient community of master horticulturalists. Her research found that these forest gardens have substantially greater plant and functional trait diversity than periphery forests, even after more than 150 years since management ceased. And that the forests managed by indigenous peoples in the past still provide diverse resources and habitats for animals and other pollinators and that are naturally more rich than traditional normal forest ecosystems. One is not far from where I am today at Seymour in Port Moody on the Burrard Inlet. And Professor Armstrong believes that her research may help us today both to better understand the history of these lands and how they were actively stewarded by First Nations prior to colonization and to help us adapt by relearning forest management practices in the face of climate change. For me, this story provides a very tangible example of how the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil -Waututh peoples cared for these lands since time immemorial and adds additional context to the land acknowledgement I used to open this event. So now I'd like to introduce Tatalia Michelle Nahani. She's a decolonial creative and strategist catalyzing social change to transform colonial narratives and impacts. She works within the intersection of class, culture, and creativity, focusing on social change through communications and deep engagement. She's the designer of a life-side board game called Sinukwe and Ladders, which I have played, and her workshop, Decolonizing Practices, aims to answer the question, what now in this era of truth and reconciliation? Her approach earned her the 2019 City of Vancouver Award of Excellence in Diversity and Inclusion. Michelle was also a 2020 Dialogue Associate with the Simon Fraser University Wask Center for Dialogue, and is the author and designer of a decolonizing workbook called Decolonize First. We're also very fortunate to work with Natalia at Vancouver Foundation through our Level Youth Policy Program over recent years. So Natalia, I turn the spotlight over to you. Thank you. And Kevin told me, Kevin, a tenoyap ten sequetel nath Natalia, Michelle Nahini kwe ansna, eslahan ohomeo sko omish ot ohomeo. Good morning, everybody. Hoth kwakwail. My ancestral name is Tatalia and my English name is Michelle Nahaney. I grew up in the village of Eslahan and I belong to the Squamish Nation. I'm really uh, honored to welcome you here uh, to this good work. I'm zooming in from the shared territory of the Squamish, Musqueam and Selvatooth peoples, the village site that we call Gumgum Light. It's also known as Railtown and recently rebranded as Vancouver's Design District. It's at the foot of Gore, uh, near where the Hastings Mill site once stood, and just up the water from uh, where my family uh, once lived in what we called uh, Kanaka Ranch, that's at the opening of Stanley Park. Uh, my ancestors are Hawaiian, Squamish, 
and Stalo on my mom on my dad's side. I identify primarily as Squamish as I'm now carrying an ancestral name uh, that goes back five generations. And I'm very honored uh, from my family uh, to be able to take care of that name uh, and bring and bring the legacy of that name forward uh, with my work um, as a decolonial facilitator and someone who identifies as an indigenous change maker uh, grounded in matriarchal ways of leadership uh, here in this city, uh, the city of Vancouver. Um, and yeah, I'm the founder of Decolonizing Practices. I'm also a CEO. My company is called Nahaney Creative Incorporated. And I've been in design and communications for 25 plus years. And then in the last four years, I've turned all of those skills uh, towards a goal of disseminating uh, decolonizing practices, taking the word decolonization out of, the, out of university and into our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, with this giant board game, which we now play online with people, uh, with my workbook, with everything that, everything that that I can do. Um, I really appreciating uh, uh, the uh, territorial acknowledgement, and I've focused a lot of energy recently on uh, making sure that uh, people don't forget or don't stop doing it uh, because there's some confusion about how to do it right or. Maybe it's not enough. Um, and so I ask everybody to keep going with it because every time you do it, you disrupt the erasure of indigenous uh, place names, of indigenous cultures, right? And everything that, that is literally the foundation that we're all standing on. So really appreciating uh, hearing, hearing Kevin's story. And, 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 and then, like I said, sharing, you know, getting to know the place names that you're on. Uh, supporting uh, local indigenous, indigenous-led, indigenous language initiatives uh, will help surface uh, more of the place names and more understanding, um, and really connect us in the in the good way. And in a good way is something you'll hear in a indigenous context, uh, which refers to being in good relations with each other. My goal in the next 20 years is that every, ter every person in every territory will understand the sacred laws of the indigenous nations whose lands you now occupy and live and work on. So you might not even know that there are sacred laws of the land uh, where, where you're currently uh, living. Um, but those te there are teachings and songs and prayers and dances embedded in that land. And my teachers, my mentors, my elders have shared that those teachings are there for everybody. And every time you acknowledge them, every time you honor them, every time you share your gratitude for them, you know, you're, you connect deeper uh, to, the, to the foundation that was set, all that good stewardship. But also, all of the good relations, you know, when I refer to this city as shared territory, I prioritize that teaching because I believe that all of the governance systems, all of our, our ways of contributing to each other's wealth, right? Our sacred laws, one of our sacred laws is Chen Chen Stwight, that's lifting each other up, right? And, and really it's, um, it's more than helping right? Helping has a power dynamic of who has the ability to help and who needs it. And then what are all the systems that decides who deserves it, right? And that's where racism and colonialism and uh, power structures uh, get in the way of who can access what. But this teaching of being in good relations and the teaching of being uh, in a good way on the land uh, and in good relations with your host nations. Um, that's a way forward that I think can support all of us uh, to be together and to really, really think through, you know, what is the foundation? What is the foundation of Vancouver Foundation, right? And we tend to think of it, the foundation as that cement that's on top of the ground. We don't think of the ground and all the teachings and the time that went into that and the history all the things that have gone past and all the things that are coming. You know, so I carry my name in a good way in service of the ancestors who are coming. So what will they say about me? 
100 years from now in the same way that I look to my grandmother and my great great grandmothers, you know, who lived through such horrific uh, racism in the face of colonialism but continue to sell their baskets and sell vegetables and work as janitors and sell uh, pies because we actually are, are business people. You know, we've been doing commerce in this land for thousands of years and we do it in a different way in service of collective benefit and service of everybody and service of our, of our descendants. But we have been doing business uh, on, on this land and really inviting you to, to look, look more into that idea of shared territory and what it meant to give so much to each other. You know, I read in the, um, some Oblate uh, ministers writing about being surprised by the negotiate, negotiation skills of the Squamish women. So I know I stand on the shoulders of some strong uh, business negotiators and I continue to run my business. Uh, and, and decolonize how I run my business, you know, and I have a percentage of my income going directly to elders. There's always um, youth, there's wellness. Uh, I run my business in a Squamish way. And I really um, uh, love to share that, to really break apart ideas about who we are and what we're capable of. And I ask you to do the same, whether you have a decolonial lens on what, on what you have been told that indigeneity is, that we're, what we're capable of, to try to see all those systems that those biases contribute to and then disrupt them by really getting to know us. So I appreciate being invited to this table this morning. I hope that I was able to share some inspiration of the ideas uh, of shared territory, of being in good relations of, uh, of committing to that foundation and seeing deeper and connecting deeper across the separation that we've been told uh, is there for us or that serves some kind of purpose. Um, the speed of business, you know, can uh, stop us from being in good relations, um, but that's only one way to look at business. There are so many other outcomes to business and I know that uh, this this uh, work of the Vancouver Foundation of everybody who's who's here today, um, using money as medicine, using money uh, as social change, it is really important. It is a very important tool of, of social change, and it's not separate um, from uh, from conversations of reconciliation and redress and decolonization. Uh, they're all together now. Uh, so. Yeah, just uh, inviting you if you're not here in this in this territory to just take a minute to really reach, feel your feet on the ground and reach down into that earth to where we're all connected in the good energy and the good medicine that's there for each of us and uh, honor those uh, ancestors who cared for the land and think about those descendants that are coming when you're making all of these good decisions and contributing to change like you do. So my hands are up to you. Chen Kwemen told me that's thank you in Squamish. I as chop to noy up to each of you. That's peace, peace to each and every one of you. Um, have a great day. We'll see you. Thanks, Natalia. I really appreciate your remarks, and um, I. I, was, I really like a number of the themes that you shared, in particular, the idea about being a good ancestor. I think uh, as well as the concepts of giving and sharing and, and your comments about business. I think a lot of those comments will resonate with members of our audience today, as, uh, as many have left legacies here to really, I think, to try to be good ancestors. Um, and money may well have been earned through business um, and the spirit of giving and sharing animates um, everyone who's here today. So thank you very much for your remarks. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Tatalia. And I, I, before I, I have a few more remarks to share with our audience today, but before I begin, I'd like to take us back to where we were just a year ago with a short uh, one minute video. So Mandy will play that for us now.
so um, what I, I wanted to just spend a few minutes today talking about uh, the year in review and acknowledge that our audience today, we've got around 200 people on the call and it's a mix of individual donors and charities. And I would really like to acknowledge the impact that COVID-19 is having on you as people, as individuals, your family, your community. You may have lost loved ones uh, during the pandemic. You probably haven't seen your loved ones for over a year, and you're all dealing with a great deal of uncertainty and stress among your families and friends, and I'd like to acknowledge that. And for the charities that are here, I'd also like to acknowledge the impact the pandemic has had on the people you serve, the donors who support you and the staff who deliver your mission. Your work is complex and difficult at the best of times, and the pandemic has layered an incredible package of extra complexity on your work, and I commend your efforts and success in meeting these challenges. To kick off the year in review, I'd like to speak about our Community Response Fund. And as you recall, the, our government declared a state of emergency in March of 2020. And at the time, we saw very clearly that charities who were providing frontline health and social services saw a dramatic spike in demand. It corresponded with the almost immediate drop in income for many charities. Arts and culture groups had to close their doors and their organizations were put at risk. So we moved quickly and formed a cross-sector partnership with Van City, the City of Vancouver, United Way, the Government of Canada, and Community Foundations of Canada and created an emergency funding program to support local charities that were dealing with the challenges of this pandemic. And over the course of 2020, in this program alone, we granted $19.9 million to 591 grantees across BC. We mobilized quickly and reduced barriers to applications to enable this to happen. Uh, and I have immense gratitude for everyone who participated in this. Many of you as donors gave money to this fund. Many stepped up quickly and generously. A couple of examples, the George Hutchison Family Foundation and Simon K. Y. Lee Fund had income available to grant, but transferred it to the Community Response Fund to support our response efforts. And I'd also like to thank our volunteer advisors who donated their time and expertise to help direct the granting. And special thanks to the charities and nonprofits on the ground without whom we could not have done any of this work. And you are responding to the needs of community and which continue today. Downtown Eastside charities we supported were included the Bloom Group, the Downtown Eastside Women's Center and WISH who adapted overnight to meet the needs of some of our most vulnerable community members. Family and social service organizations like Mum to Mum Child Poverty Initiative and House of Omid worked to ensure that low income children and refugee families weren't left behind. And the arts and culture organizations that reimagined ways to connect communities. We saw Kickstart Disability Arts and Culture and the Dawson Creek Art Gallery pivot to deliver programs online and over distance. But in addition to our emergency response funding, we stepped up all our other granting streams. In 2020, we distributed a total of $114.9 million in grants and charitable activities, a dramatic increase over the previous year's high water mark of just under 70 million. For us, 2020 was a testament to the Vancouver Foundation model and our processes. At a time when many organizations were struggling because donor dollars were down, we were able to use our endowment model to serve as a pillar of strength and support for our community. For us, this is about using our position to step up when communities in need. But we know the needs continue. We're over a year into the pandemic and there's a long road to recovery. A survey from Vantage Point released in February revealed that almost half of British Columbia's nonprofits anticipate the need to close operations if the current situation continues. At the same time, almost 60% report an increased demand for programs and services. Those particularly at risk are small nonprofits and organizations that serve racialized communities, because we have all seen that inequities only deepen in times of crisis. And we all want to step up. Donors who are in the audience today with donor advised funds with us, please continue to grant out accumulated income into community at this important time. And if you're having difficulty deciding where to grant, we're here to help you in only a phone call or a chat away. And Vancouver Foundation is doing our part in our discretionary granting. So in 2020, we streamlined our application process, minimized barriers for grantees, and really trusted them to do what they do best. We want to continue to move forward to do more trust-based funding to help charities adapt and innovate. And this means things like making more core and operational funding available, reducing barriers to eligibility and reducing record, reporting requirements while retaining and recognizing the responsibility of charities. We want to work with local groups who have the best understanding of their communities, and make permanent any improvements that were introduced to simplify access to funding during the pandemic. 
This is part of our commitment to more equitable, inclusive grant making as a community foundation. So 21, 2021 is shaping up to be an exciting year and you'll hear more about this theme of our granting from Dara Parker and Rekha Pavanatharaja from our grants and community initiatives later in the webinar. But first, I'd like to shift gears and introduce and hand over to Eugene Lee, our VP of Investments, and David Christopher, who's a Vancouver Foundation board member and chair of our investment committee. Eugene and David will host the next section reporting on our 2020 investment performance. So Eugene, over to you. Great. Thank you, Kevin and Tatalia, and good morning, everyone. I'm Eugene Lee, Vice President of Investments at Vancouver Foundation. This is the fifth year that I've, I've had the pleasure of presenting our investment update with David Christopher, the chair of our investment committee. And on behalf of Vancouver Foundation, we are very thankful that we have such dedicated volunteers like David, who spends many hours of their time in supporting Vancouver Foundation and our community. In the next 25 minutes, David and I will provide you with an overview of how our investments performed in 2020 and what to expect as the markets head into a period of recovery in 2021 and beyond. If you have any questions at the end of the presentation, we invite you to please contact your Vancouver Foundation representative and we will follow up to answer all of your questions. We have quite a full agenda, so let's get started. So unprecedented is probably the most overused word last year. There was an article published in the New York Times in December that surveyed 20,000 corporate presentations. And these were the most common terms that they found. And I'm sure there are no surprises on this, on this list. And unprecedented would certainly be how we would categorize our experience in the capital markets last year. And if you look at the numbers on the screen at last year's presentation, we left off with these returns and, and, uh, uh, and the oil price was at $20. The pandemic had just been declared and we were at the height of market volatility. No one could have predicted that we would end the year with one of the strongest market recoveries in history. And you can see here, Canadian equities went from minus 20% all the way back up to 5.6% positive. US and global equities went from minus double digits to positive double digits. And Canadian bonds, especially because of all of the central bank stimulus that's been pumped into the economy, that essentially lowered uh, uh, interest rates and lowered bond yields. And it's essentially, it, it lifted the, the total return of bonds. And if you look at oil prices, it actually was at $20. It actually surprisingly went all the way to zero and, and even negative and back up to about $48 at the end of the year. And so far this year, equity markets have continued to rally. However, when you look at bonds, on the other hand, the spike in bond yields recently meant that total return for bonds, especially longer term bonds, have turned negative. And lastly, commodity prices is another area to watch this year. Here we can see how oil prices have essentially tripled from a year ago. At Vancouver Foundation, our endowment is invested in two main funds. The CTF, or our Consolidated Trust Fund, and the SRI, our Socially Responsible Investment Fund. Here, I've shown the valuation of both of the funds at the end of December, 1.3 billion for the CTF, and 31 million for the SRI. Although these are big numbers, we don't want to be known for what we have. It's what we do with what we have that counts. And more and more, we want our managers and our assets to be doing more, to show continuous improvement. In 2020, over 90% of our assets are now managed to an environmental, social, and corporate governance policy, or ESG for short. And all but one of our investment managers are signatories to the UNPRI. So that's the United Nations Principles for, <clears throat> excuse me, for re Responsible Investment. Our Socially Responsible Investment Fund has also been successful in getting very competitive returns while focusing on sustainable investing and screening out tobacco, weapons, and carbon intensive industries. Lastly, we are very proud to announce that earlier this year, Vancouver Foundation became a signatory to the Canadian Investor Statement on Diversity and Inclusion. 
And recently, we have been busy looking into the area of impact investing. We hope to share more about these initiatives with you over the next couple of months. Next, let's look at how the funds have performed last year. This slide shows the returns of the Consolidated Trust Fund over the past year, as well as the longer term five and 10 years. Although we experienced a slight negative return in the first quarter of last year, the fund, the CTF, similar to the market, made up all of its losses to come out ahead with a one-year return of 10.2%, which is something that we could not have imagined at the start of last year. And when we look at the longer term five-year and 10-year track record, the results have been continued to be very strong. On average, the CTF has returned an annualized 10-year return of 8.6%. And so far this year, the fund is up 2.8% to the end of March. Diversification has always been a key to our investment strategy. Given the volatility last year, we have really seen how the power of diversifying by asset class, diversifying by investment styles, even ge geographies and currencies could play such a big role in reducing risk and enhancing return. Last year, we saw some of our growth, equity, and multi-strategy managers perform extraordinarily well. For example, Comgest, who manages our global equities, and Polar, our multi-strategy manager, both gained over 20% in 2020. And so far this year, we're seeing a rotation to more cyclical stocks. And as a result, our value-oriented managers, such as Burgundy and Black Creek that you see on the screen, have started to outperform. This is a chart that we've consistently included in all of our presentations over the last five years. It shows the annual return of the CTF over the past 25 years from 1996 to 2020. With the exception of a slight dip in 2018, over the past 12 years, the markets have only headed in one direction, and that's higher. I probably sound a bit like a broken record, but believe it or not, markets do go down, and sometimes by a whole lot, like in 2008 and sometimes for consecutive years like 2001 and 2002. We obviously can't predict what markets, where markets will be or what will happen in 2021, but most of our managers tell us that we're likely closer to the top of the market than the bottom of the market. In other words, returns in the next couple of years are expected to trend lower. Net, let's now turn our focus to the SRI fund. And here we're looking at the returns for the Social Responsible Investment Fund. In addition to what I said earlier, the negative screens of no tobacco, weapons, nuclear power, the mandate of this fund is also fossil free. It does not invest in carbon intensive industries such as oil and gas and mining. In fact, these limitations worked in the fund's favor given the depressed valuation of energy and commodity stocks over the last few years. The SRI performed extremely well in 2020 even better than the CTF, gaining 12.9%. And if you look at the longer term of five and 10 years, it's beginning, it's catching up to where we are at in terms of the CTF. The 10-year annualized return for the SRI fund now sits at 8.3%. And year to date, these are the numbers, the fund is up 1.9% year to date. Now, because the SRI is a much smaller fund, its asset mix is also simpler and, and less diversified. So as the fund grows, we hope to revisit the asset mix and enhance, and, and enhance its diversification similar to that of the CTF. Lastly, we'll touch on our distribution formula and our distributions for, the, for this year. For those of you that have attended our previous presentations, you would be familiar with our distribution formula. The formula that we use is a hybrid formula, sometimes called the Yale formula, because it's also used by the Yale University Endowment. Essentially, it's a smoothing formula that takes into account the current income, as well as the prevailing market conditions. If you look at the formula, 70% of the income is derived from prior year's distribution. So no matter what happens to the market this year, 70% of the income will essentially be locked in. The other 30% does fluctuate a little more, as it's based on the, our 4% distribution target, as well as the current year's June 30th market value. And finally, here's a chart that's showing the current and historical distribution rates for the CTF and the SRI. You can see that it has been relatively stable year over year for the past five years. 
So now I'll hand the presentation over to David to talk about the macroeconomic picture and highlight some of the areas to watch out, watch out for in the next couple of years. Over to you, David. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And thank you, Eugene, for that great overview of the portfolio. Uh, today, I will give a brief update on the investment committee. We'll look at central bank, bank activity and its impact on fixed income markets. We will review some charts that will give us a better understanding of opportunities in the equity markets. Uh, we'll take a look at long-term inflation and we will review a chart to help manage expectations about future returns. When we met a year ago, we looked at the equity markets reaction to the pandemic in the context of other bear markets. As a reminder, it was the fastest onset of a bear market in history, taking only 22 days. Furthermore, in March of last year, the S&P 500 had three of its biggest daily percentage gains and losses in the post-depression period. At that time, global governments had announced 8 trillion of fiscal support, equal to 9.5% of gross domestic product. By the end of the year, over 14 trillion of support was announced, equaling over 16.5% of global GDP. In addition, there were 190 rate cuts around the world in 2020. To put that in perspective, that is four rate cuts every five trading days. Truly massive fiscal and monetary stimulus. We also discussed the response by central banks expanding their balance sheets to buy government, mortgage, investment grade, and high yield debt. The playbook for this was set during the great financial crisis of 2008-2009. During the period from the onset of the pandemic through the end of 2020, central banks purchased over 1.5 billion of bonds per hour. By the end of 2020, there were in excess of 18 trillion of negative yielding global sovereign bonds, around 30% of the market. This will have significant implications for portfolio management for many years to come. Finally, at our last meeting, we spoke about the overall direction of risk assets being determined to a significant degree by our progress towards vaccines. On this front, we certainly have had some great news. Now I'd like to give you an update on the investment committee. We currently have an investment committee of eight people. I would like to thank Dan Russell and Eric Watt for their fantastic work on the committee over many years. They would be truly missed and have added tremendous value to our process. I'm very excited to announce that Don Gia has agreed to join the board of the Vancouver Foundation and will replace Eric as vice chair of the investment committee. Don is the president and CEO of UBC Investment Management Trust. Prior to her current role, Don was a senior portfolio manager for the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board. She also serves on the investment committee of the Ontario Hospitals Association. Also, I'd like to welcome Rob Edel to the, as the newest member to our committee. He is the Chief Investment Officer at Nicola Wealth Management. He has a Chartered Financial Analyst designation and is a graduate of the UBC Sauter School of Business. He'll be joining us in June. I would like to thank all committee members for their amazing support of the Vancouver Foundation throughout this difficult year. The amount of time devoted to the portfolio and our managers certainly increased. A special thank you to Kelly Woodall, who, for heading our subcommittee to review our Canadian equity mandates. I would also like to recognize the great work of Eugene Lee, Adrian Cartano, and Bonnie Wong at the Vancouver Foundation. I thought I'd start the investment section of this presentation with this amusing cartoon. All of us have had to find new ways to keep active during the pandemic. This individual spends his time running between financial institution, institutions in search of yield on his investments. I hope you found more enjoyable ways to stay active. Something we are very mindful of at the investment committee is not chasing returns. As a reminder, our objective is to earn a real return of three and a half percent at the portfolio level. As discussed last session, we will hold individual asset classes that do not meet this return objective, but do add diversification benefits to the portfolio. For example, the yield on our fixed income portfolio going into the pandemic was nowhere close to our return objective. However, with very strong capital appreciation, our fixed income portfolio earned 11% last year. When I asked Dan Russell, our fixed income expert, when we could expect another year with fixed income earning above 10%, he told me 2041. So I look forward to checking back with Dan in 2042. Uh, the first several charts we will look at today attempt to answer the question of where has all the yield gone? 
we will now look at a chart focusing on cash account returns. This chart helps explain why the individual in the cartoon was out chasing for yield. On the left-hand side of this chart, you can see the amount of money earned on a savings account going back to the mid-1990s. The amount invested in all periods is $100,000. The blue dashes show the amount of money you would need to earn to keep up with inflation in every given year. Note that through the 1990s and from 2005 to 2007, you're able to earn a return above inflation on your savings accounts. Since the great financial crisis, you have not been able to earn a return close to inflation. These incredibly low rates are the direct result of central bank activity and may be a driving factor in some of the speculative activity we've seen in certain types of investments today. The next chart we will look at, at interest rates um, and the global bond market. This chart breaks down the global bond market into nominal yield buckets. If inflation is around 2%, we would need a nominal yield to be above 5.5% to achieve our real return target of 3.5%. Of the dark blue shaded area represents bonds with greater than a 4% return. This was the largest part of the market going into the financial crisis and the smallest now. These are the highest yielding in the market and even they do not meet our real, real return objectives. As you can see from the light blue part of the chart at the bottom right, we have experienced negative yields for the past six years in a significant part of the market. As mentioned earlier, this bucket is over $18 trillion in size. Currently, the bulk of the market, as represented by the medium blue area, constitutes bonds that yield between zero and 2%. As you can see from this chart, we're living in a yield starved market. Another example of this is the high yield or junk bond market in the US, yielding a historic low of 4%. We will now shift our focus to the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. As you can see, prior to the 2008 crisis, the balance sheet was quite stable. Through the financial crisis, the balance sheet grew by three and a half trillion dollars. Fast forward to the pandemic, and you can see how quickly the Fed responded by over doubling its balance sheet. This expansion was done by the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank. Not only did this buying center on government bonds, but also mortgages, investment grade, and high yield debt. So the question, where's all the yield gone? can be answered in large part by to the central banks. As a reminder, in 2018, the Federal Reserve reduced its balance sheet by about 15%, which puts significant pressure on long-term rates. 10-year US Treasuries hit three and a quarter percent, which destabilized other markets. As central banks stop growing their balance sheets or look for ways to reduce them, we will need to be mindful of what happened in 2018. Harry Houdini, is the world-renowned illusionist who was famous for his escape acts. I certainly hope the central banks can learn from Harry and successfully reverse some of the massive intervention we have seen around the globe without significantly destabilizing other risk assets. We will now look at the Canadian bond market. This chart shows a 20-year history of income return in blue and price return in yellow of the Canadian Universe Bond Index. As you can see throughout the entire period, the income return has declined steadily, steadily to its historic low in 2020. The last two years has seen significant extra price returns as yields have fallen. This is a tailwind that appears to be coming to an end. As we'll see in the following chart, one component of return, return has changed significantly over the last 20 years. This chart uses data from the long-term corporate bond index to decompose elements of risk borne by a corporate investor, namely the risk-free rate, liquidity risk, and credit risk. As you can see from the large blue bar on the left-hand side, the risk-free rate was 5.6% in 2001 to compensate for federal government risk for a term matching the long index. On the right side, you can see the blue bar yielding 1.15% today, a full 4.5% lower. As a result of all the central bank activity we have discussed, risk-free return in 2001 has turned into return-free risk today. Back in 2001, we had a market clearing price for government risk. Today, we do not. As you can see from the gray areas representing credit risk and liquidity risk, 
uh, things haven't changed much in the last 20 years as it relates to those two areas. The next chart looks at the historical diversification benefits of fixed income. This chart shows that government bonds have historically been a key source of diverse, diversification for portfolio with a low to negative correlation to equity markets. As you can see on the top right corner of the chart, the high yield bond correlation to our equity exposure is much higher. We do not want to chase yield with little portfolio diversification benefit. Furthermore, the segment alone does not come close to our real return objective. We will now look at a graph that outlines the growth in global, global government debt. This chart looks at global advanced economies and emerging economies public debt relative to GDP. As can be seen in the global financial crisis and the pandemic, we have seen an incredible deterioration in our debt relative to the size of our economy. We would need to go back to the end of World War II to get to such elevated levels. The interest rate environment we have discussed is not consistent with the fiscal deterioration we have seen in this chart. Now I would like to focus on a few equity related charts. This chart shows the forward price earnings ratio on the S&P 500. As you can see, you would have to go back to the late 1990s to find a market overall valuation similar to what we see today. We also have a market that has been dominated by five stocks that represent over 22% of the market cap. That is Microsoft, Alphabet, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. By comparison, in 1999, the top five stocks represented just over 16.5% of the market. So we do have a market that is more concentrated today as it relates to the S&P 500. Uh, perhaps the interest rate structure we discussed earlier supports higher valuations today than what we saw in the late 1990s. As a reminder, our investment committee is not tactical and we stick to our long-term strategic asset allocation parameters. We will now look at uh, valuation dispersion. This is a chart that I really like as it highlights the opportunities available to active managers. This chart shows the dispersion in valuation between the most expensive and cheapest stocks on the S&P 500. This is, this is the gray shaded area. The wider the gray area, the bigger the opportunity set. You'd have to go back to the late 1990s to find an environment with such a dispersion in valuations. The green line through the middle represents the median price earnings ratio. Let's now look at a uh, chart on sector leadership. This chart looks at two time periods. The gray line represents the sector performance for the portion of the year prior to the first vaccine announcement. The green line represents the performance since the Pfizer vaccine announcement on November 9th. As you can see from the bottom of the chart, online retail, home improvement, and technology were the top performers up until November. At the top of the chart, you can see the sectors hit hardest during the early stage of the pandemic have been the biggest winners since the vaccine announcement. Energy, airlines, and retail reads top the list. Also notable is the scale at the bottom of the chart with declines of up to 50% and advances as much as 70% within one year. We have seen a significant re recovery in the performance of our value managers over the past two quarters as we have seen a significant rotation from growth to value. As you can see from the chart, there's been an abundance of opportunity for active portfolio management. We will now look at one of the biggest risks to endowments and pension funds, inflation. This is a 50 year chart looking at inflation in the United States. The Federal Reserve has stated that central bank will let inflation run above their 2% target for a period of time without a policy response. In other words, they're willing to risk higher inflation in order to ensure a strong recovery in employment. If you went back to the late 1970s or the early 1980s, when inflation was extremely high, you were able to earn a fair return managing fixed income assets. Today, we start with real yields that are unrealistically low due to the, due to the reasons we have discussed. Central banks around the world will need to be sure to not let the inflation genie out of the bottle as we strive to gain economic recovery from the pandemic and hopefully attempt to pay down a massive debt load. Let's, let's now look at a chart to guide us on future returns. If you measure investor risk tolerance, it is always the highest after strong bull markets and the lowest during the big bears. 
Similarly, when surveying people's expectations about future returns, recency bias plays a huge part in their answers. This chart shows a 60-40 portfolio with 60% equity exposure and 40% fixed income. This is a blend of the earnings yield on the S&P 500 and the yield on the Barclays US Aggregate Bond Index. As you can see from the chart, 35 years ago, the yield on this 60-40 portfolio was close to 12%, almost four times higher than today's value. Although the Vancouver Foundation, we have a more diversified portfolio than this one, this chart certainly provides guidance toward lower expected future returns. The following chart is a reminder of who manages the assets of the Vancouver Foundation. In conclusion, the investment committee spends a tremendous amount of time choosing our managers and analyzing our asset mix to be confident that we can achieve a return above our benchmark over the long term. In many ways, we are living in unprecedented times. The massive fiscal and monetary stimulus previously outlined will be supportive of strong economic growth in the near term. However, as Warren Buffett said at the Berkshire Hathaway AGM this past weekend, interest rates are to the value of assets what gravity is to matter. We need to be mindful of this as we consider investment returns going forward. As a long-term investor, we need to be able to weather short-term volatility to ensure we have the best chance of meeting or exceeding our benchmark returns over time. 2020 proved to be a very good case study in support of this approach. We experienced a significant decline in the first quarter, followed by a very strong recovery throughout the balance of the year. Staying the course through the eye of the storm was the key to this outcome. Thank you very much for your ongoing support and confidence in the Vancouver Foundation. I will now pass the call over to Dara Parker. Dara is Vice President of Grants and Community Initiatives, and she will speak about some important work that the Vancouver Foundation is beginning to explore this year. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Dara Parker, and as David shared, I'm the Vice President of Grants and Community Initiatives, the department that helps spend the money. I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from the beautiful territories of the Silix Okanagan people, unceded lands that I'm grateful to be living on as a guest. As you know, Vancouver Foundation has a long, proud history of supporting communities across BC. Over the last 78 years, we've granted almost $1.5 billion across the province to help build healthy, vibrant, and inclusive communities. And this is all made possible by the over 2,000 individual donors and agencies who have trusted Vancouver Foundation to manage their endowments. And over 78 years, the needs and priorities of our community have changed, and we've evolved along with them. In 2014, Vancouver Foundation made the courageous decision to deepen the impact of our work by launching systems change grants. And since it predates me, I can brag about Vancouver Foundation in this way. And I say courageous because focusing on systems change means moving upstream to explore root causes, which is inherently more complex work. For example, determining how to deliver meals to people that are hungry is difficult and important work. Determining how to address the root causes that create food insecurity in the first place shifts that work from difficult to extremely complex. And it's the kind of complexity that doesn't lend itself to easy measurements, like the number of meals served that you can highlight in the annual report. It also requires much longer time commitments, which are not always for the faint of heart. And for us, it meant charting new territory, as there are very few funders who are directly funding systems change work. This meant developing a granting system without a clear roadmap. And today, that has led us to funding hundreds of exciting and meaningful systems change projects that we're incredibly proud of. And we've learned we can do better. As an organization committed to being responsible and adaptable, we wanted an independent perspective on how we were doing. So in 2018, we commissioned an external evaluation of our systems change grants. That is just a delightful 113 page read that I really encourage you to dedicate your weekend to. But in case that's not on your agenda, the headline is that overall, our investment in systems change is very positive, and we are helping to create the conditions for systems change across BC. 
and there were many areas where we can do even better. We learned that our application process privileges those who already have access, relationships, and influence, despite our efforts to the contrary. We unintentionally prioritized linearity, the written word, and the English language, and recognized that our definition of systems change narrowed who would be most likely to receive grants. We also focused on project ideas exclusively, which means we didn't look at who was leading the work and their proximity to the issue they are addressing. What this meant is that larger urban-based organizations that could navigate applications in academic language tended to do best in our system. These biases created unintended barriers for communities that are often most impacted by the systems that create harm and who we believe are essential to delivering solutions. So last year, we launched an initiative to make our grants more equitable. We chose to focus on improvements that made our application process more accessible. But after 10 months of deep work and learning and doing, we came to understand that we needed to think bigger. As we engaged with our communities, they continued to ask us questions that went far beyond systems change granting. We are really proud to be a community inspired foundation. It's core to who we are. And what that means is that we prioritize listening to those on the ground and responding to our community's calls for action. As we reflected on what we'd learned in our systems change evaluation, we realized biases and barriers exist throughout our organization and in all aspects of our work. We also realized that to truly embed a commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, we need to think beyond granting. We need to ensure all aspects of our work are aligned to clear, focused beliefs. And we heard clear encouragement from our community to do more in this direction through our level program participants, through community engagement with nonprofit leaders, through the Racial Equity and Justice and Philanthropy Funders Summit last summer, and through Black and Indigenous and racialized communities, we heard frustration at the barriers they face accessing and securing reliable and flexible funding. These signals come during a time when there is a global spotlight on racial injustice that we all have a responsibility to address. And these signals have been amplified by the pandemic, which exposed the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on certain communities. For example, we find ourselves in a she session that is sending women, setting women's equality significantly backwards. We also know that racialized communities are more likely to be working in low income jobs that increase vulnerability during the pandemic. And that black and indigenous people are more likely to contract COVID-19 than other Canadians. We also know that people with disabilities have experienced increased isolation over the last year. And this is by no means an exhaustive list Overall, the pandemic has revealed how a crisis can deepen existing inequities and further widen gaps. And that's why our board made a decision in 2020 to explore how we can do more to shift and share power so that we embed justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion across our mission. We see this as both a journey and a destination, as a process and an outcome that begins this year, but is ongoing. In 2021, we're continuing to grant based on our current model, while we design and deliver a new organization-wide approach to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. We're delivering all current community grant streams and programs and have largely allocated our 2021 granting budget this year. And we did this in order to provide the time and flexibility to reimagine our discretionary granting and programs. Simultaneously, we are exploring changes to other parts of the organization that will embed our commitment to justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion throughout Vancouver Foundation. Our aspiration is to shift our work in service of those who too often have been left out so that everyone can be part of our mission. And this work is unfolding in three phases, discovery, designing, and embedding. We're currently in the discovery phase of exploring what it means to shift and share power. And I've stressed that our organization prides itself on being directed by and responsive to the communities we serve. This will always be core to who we are. But over the last year, we've come to understand that this approach, without more intentional effort, can unintentionally privilege those who already have access and influence. That the appearance of neutrality is never neutral and that we ourselves are part of a system. While the idea of being responsive to community priorities is commendable, it can mean that those who already have representation 
disproportionately influence the priorities and direction of the organization. More importantly, it, mean those with, it can mean that those with less power continue to be left out. And that's why we're exploring how we might do more to shift and share power at Vancouver Foundation and how we might use our influence to inspire others to join with us in new ways of working. So what might be different? We're exploring ways to move towards trust-based philanthropy and foster even greater participatory decision-making. We're considering how we might prioritize relationships over high volume transactional work. We're examining ideas about the role of charity and philanthropy in changing systems and which systems we wanna to continue to invest in and which ones we want to change. We're thinking about who we partner with and how those partnerships are cultivated. But what will stay the same is our service, being in relationship with individual donors and agency endowment holders to help them achieve their philanthropic goals through Vancouver Foundation. I don't know if you can tell on Zoom, but I'm pretty excited by the work ahead this year. In fact, I'm very excited and I hope you'll join us because we know that Vancouver Foundation can't build a more just and equitable society through granting alone, and that we must embed these concepts across the organization. For advisors of donor advised funds, for those who would like us to continue providing the same service we always have, we remain committed to carrying out your philanthropic wishes. That will not change. For those who are curious about exploring new ways of imagining philanthropy, we welcome you to engage with us in this work. In fact, if you're interested in participating in our discovery process, I encourage you to write discovery in the chat box right now in real time, or you can use the raise your hand function on Zoom and staff will capture your name so that we can follow up to engage you. We believe improving the way we grant together with new ways of thinking about procurement, recruiting, communications, advocacy and investments will position us to do even more to build a future where everyone belongs. And of course, this is a team effort. The reason we're able to take on this meaningful challenge is thanks to the volunteers, donors, fund advisors, and community organizations who have built us to where we are today. And we want you all to be involved in building where we go next. So in the coming months, we'll be sharing learning tools that unpack concepts of charity, justice, and community change. And so do keep an eye on our website for more information and ways you can participate and share your thoughts. I would also love to have coffee with all 226 of you. In fact, I'd love to have coffee with anyone who's not in my bubble. Uh, so uh, let's cross our fingers that we can reconvene in real life soon uh, to engage further. We know there's a long road ahead. 78 year old institutions don't change overnight, but we're committed to moving forward in partnership with our community. And speaking of partnership, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and co-lead on the work to shift and share power, Rekha Pavanatharaja. Rekha is the Director of Systems Change at Vancouver Foundation, and she's going to be hosting a community conversation today that helps give meanings to some of the ideas I've just shared. Over to you, Rekha. Thank you so much, Dara. I I know I should already be excited about this work, but after hearing you speak, I, I just want to let you know that I'm extra excited and, and really thrilled to be here. Um, good morning, folks. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to share that I am joining you today from the shared territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, and, and with that, bring my respect and gratitude to be able to be doing this work on these lands today. And it is my honor to welcome Sarah Kim and Christian Benso today. Sarah and Christian join us in their capacity as community developers at Collingwood Neighborhood House in East Vancouver. Together, their team leads the systems change initiative there and helps facilitate meaningful dialogue in community around anti-racism and civic engagement. Between this dynamic duo, they bring 30 years of experience working in community development, the arts, and the food justice sectors. And Sarah and Cretion have both served as community advisors with Vancouver Foundation. Recently, 
they joined us at the board at a board retreat dinner where they led an inspiring and honest conversation that left many of us thinking more about how we might better serve community moving forward and in particular right now as we find ourselves in the middle of a global pandemic so it is my honor to welcome Sarah and Christian today. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Rika. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. So my name is Christian, and I'm excited to be here with my colleague, Sarah, and share more about our work at Collingwood Neighborhood House. We also wanted to acknowledge that we're on the unceded and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So let's begin by talking a little bit about Collingwood Neighborhood House. CNH, otherwise known as Collingwood, is a nonprofit organization in Renfrew Collingwood of Vancouver. We're a place to grow and a place to belong. Typically, neighborhood houses focus on programs and services. At CNH, we lead everything under the sun, and you can see our PowerPoint slide, we have things such as cooking to arts and crafts, dancing. We also have essential services such as settlement services, childcare, and homeless services. This week is also Neighborhood House Week, so it's a great opportunity to learn about your local neighborhood house. But over the past two years, with funding from the Systems Change Grant from the Vancouver Foundation, our team is leading our own systems change initiative to embed equity and justice in our community and throughout BC. Next slide, please. So what's the context and history of the work? In the last decade, we were really focused on increasing human connection. Our big problem was that we wanted to address community loneliness. And our big question was, how do we get neighbors who live together on the same block or on the same apartment floor to have positive and authentic relationships with one another? Through this work, we discovered something different. We learned neighbors wanted to take action on the systemic violence and injustices that community members were facing, such as racism, cultural displacement, and gentrification they wanted support to organize around these issues. This was a turning point in our work where we realized we needed to be better advocates for the community. And a bigger question, how can a place such as a neighborhood house transform where our neighbors can come together, organize, and talk about different things like racism, gentrification, poverty, healthcare, policy development, and civic engagement. Next slide, please. These are big and complex topics. So how do we lead this work and what kind of work are we leading with our community? To respond to this, we have three principles that guide us in our work. The first is capacity building and leadership development. This looks like providing tools, opportunities and frameworks for community members to develop their leadership skills in systems change. The second principle is convening and connecting. We believe that people and relationships are at the heart of systems change work, and thus we create and facilitate spaces for people to come together and discuss these complex topics that are important to them. And the third principle is policy change through community input. With ARC and alongside our community, we disrupt civic engagement processes to rewrite policies. And Cretion will now share more about our Navigator project and link these principles to this initiative. Next slide, please. Thanks, Sarah. So I know you're wondering, how do these principles come to life? What do they look like when we do them in communities? So. Something that Sarah and I are really proud of is our work collaborating with the City of Vancouver and other neighborhood houses across Vancouver to disrupt the civic planning process. Underrepresented communities have criticized the City of Vancouver's planning process as it doesn't center marginalized voices and it acts as a tool for gentrification and displacement. 
through our project, the Vancouver Plan and the Navigator Program, we're challenging the civic engagement model to become more equitable. Through our principle of capacity building and leadership development, we're working together to identify, convene, and support neighbors to lead civic engagement with underrepresented communities on behalf of the city of Vancouver. Our neighbors in this role hold the name of navigators and they lead conversations in their communities about everything from truth and reconciliation, racism, public art, environment, engineering, and more. This is part of our convening and connecting principle. Ultimately, this information and feedback is returning back to the city of Vancouver, where planners are now analyzing the data for their policymaking decisions. The feedback is being considered into the new planning project called the Vancouver Plan. And this upcoming summer, we hope to continue working with the city to create a learning laboratory where neighbors can learn how policy is written at the city and then have the opportunity to co-write the policy with a city planner. Our goal is to create an experience where community members can see their feedback go all the way to being approved in council chambers by the mayor and city council. This is part of our policy change through community input principle. Next slide, please. Thanks, Krishan. Another initiative that we're leading is the Scale Your Impact Certificate Program. Our big question here is, how do we support neighbors to be change makers around the issues that they are concerned about? We recognize that education is an important and powerful first step. So we developed a free certificate program where people are learning about the principles of systems change and their roles and abilities as leaders within these systems. This is a robust learning opportunity. And one outcome has been that participants have now become teachers leading webinars on systems change for their communities. Our work continues to expand and next we'll be leading a systems change workshop with the neighborhood small grants community at their summit in June. This is just a small example of the work that we do at Collingwood Neighborhood House with our systems change initiatives. Can we close the slideshow and Reka, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you both for taking the time to walk us through your work. Um, I, have, I have a lot of questions, but uh, I know we only have time for a few today. Um, so is it okay if we get started? Yes, of course. Sure. Great. Um, so when Dara spoke, she talked about the context of systems change and, and really named that it's complex, the process is not linear, and often we know that it doesn't satisfy the outcomes that funders typically look for in project-based work. Uh, and so when Vancouver Foundation invested in systems change uh, as a focus several years ago, this was an opportunity for initiatives like yours to be resourced in this way. And I share this because I'm curious to learn more about how your work has shifted since receiving a systems change grant from Vancouver Foundation. And, and also in the context of COVID over the last year. Thanks, Rekha. I'd love to answer that question. So COVID has really changed the way that we're interacting with each other. And we continue to try to build a network of change makers through online communication. As an organization and in this current pandemic, we're building a culture of experimentation. We're trying different ways to connect safely with neighbors, whether that be through phone calls, Zoom meetings, or socially distant programs. We're trying to have an open discussion to talk about racism with our staff, and that's a difficult and hard conversation to have. In spite of the pandemic, we're investing our resources to try something new, create new opportunities, make mistakes, and iterate. We don't assume that we're doing the same thing every week as a systems change team, but we're open-minded to change. We're embedding a working culture of flexibility and regularly listening to the, to the communities that we serve. 
Communities are complex. People's needs and aspirations are complex. So therefore, that needs to be reflected in the ways that we're working. Our organization is taking great strides in being a community catalyst for advocacy, whether it be about affordable childcare, the protection of cultural food assets, or policy change. Our advocate role has become even more important because of the pandemic. This is important to note because systems change is not a fixed process. It's not a predictable process and systems change isn't a process that relies on perfection. Systems change is a way that we can challenge our own assumptions and challenge our relationships with the system so that we can dismantle systems for the better. Thank you, Reka. Thank you so much, Krishan. That, that was really powerful and, and I think really important for us collectively to hear how your work um, has changed since shifting from project-based and into uh, system change, thinking about the root causes. And so with that, I, I also wanna ask you about the, sh the shadow side of systems change work um, because systems change work as we've established is complex and constantly changing. And I can imagine no matter how comfortable you are with change, it can be hard. And within the context of COVID, it must be extremely challenging. Uh, and so I'd like to learn more about what challenges you have faced and what challenges you are currently facing in this work right now. Thanks for the question, Reka. I'd like to share a challenge that our community is facing and then share some of the challenges that we face as an organization. Um, one challenge that has been exacerbated by the pandemic that we have repeatedly heard from our community is around language accessibility. We have been working with a group of service providers in the Renfrew Collingwood neighborhood on an anti-racism strategy. And in these conversations, language barriers and accessibility continues to come up. In our neighborhood, Chinese seniors have lacked access to translated materials in a timely manner such as COVID-19 protocols, and more recently, the vaccine rollouts. Last fall during the pre provincial election, they did not receive um, translated materials on how to vote. And more recently, there have been multiple rezoning developments in our area and it, that are displacing our neighbors. And again, translated materials are not being received on how the developments will be affecting our, our community members. The challenge of language accessibility is not just being heard in our neighborhood, but all across the lower mainland. And this affects not just seniors, yet also newcomers to Canada and anyone whose first language is not English. One of the challenges that we face as an organization in systems change are the current funding models and processes. Relationships are foundational for systems change and developing authentic relationships takes time, sometimes years. And thus one of the challenges we face in our work is the lack of sustainable multi-year funding for longevity. As an example, we at Collingwood Neighborhood House are currently in our final year of our funding cycle with the Vancouver Foundation and need to seek additional funding in order to continue our work. As Krishan mentioned earlier, systems change work is not predictable nor perfect. And due to these complexities, reporting and applying for funding can be challenging when numbers, data and outcomes are sought out to be finite and fixed. Another challenge that we face is the lack of resources and supports to sustain our communities in ways that are reciprocal. It takes a lot of time and energy and advocacy needed to do this work. And large systems such as governments do not take into consideration the needs of community members and interactions with these larger systems feels more transactional. We hear of and see community losing trust in these systems due to these inequities. I wanna emphasize that the challenges that I've shared with you that we face in our work are not unique to us at Collingwood Neighborhood House. 
We have heard from our colleagues and peers at various community organizations who also work in systems change that they too face similar challenges. And Christian and I are grateful to be voices from the community today and for this opportunity to share with you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I really appreciate your honesty. Um, thank you for speaking openly about your work and the challenges that you and so many other communities face. Um, part of this process involves hearing what we're not noticing. And you know, I really wanna express my gratitude for you bringing that in this conversation today. Uh, you're certainly leaving us with a lot to think about as we embark on this work as a foundation. And, and so sort of the big question that I have for us today is how might community foundations support you and community better? And what role can or should community foundations play in working towards disrupting and challenging systems that don't actually serve community? Thanks, Rika. That's a, that's a pretty big question that Sarah and I have been thinking about throughout our work. So we believe that foundations and ultimately donors need to also take action on injustice and inequity. So our staff, participants and partners are talking about how to embed anti-racism, equity and justice in our work. So therefore, I think it's important that funders and donors also be part of the learning journey. Just as we are approaching an open mind to our work, I want donors to also be open-minded and curious about what it means to lead justice. When I learned that the Vancouver Foundation is pivoting its work to recognize justice, it makes me really excited because it shows that the foundation is not only being on track with how participants want to see change on the ground, but it also shows that the foundation is participating in its own systems change model and transforming for the better. This allows Vancouver Foundation to catch up to the innovation that's already happening in communities. This allows Vancouver Foundation to become relevant to what's being shared on the news or on social media with my peers and on my kitchen table. I think this shows that the philanthropy sector can change. Instead of just providing a helping hand, I want the philanthropy sector to be courageous, to lead justice and to be forward thinking. When the Vancouver Foundation shifts to a justice-centered funding model, it acts as a beacon for nonprofits to better align their work towards justice and systems change. Systems change is slow and sticky, and we recognize that. But we need to do it while carrying this duty of justice and equity, anti-racism, and anti-oppression. This is how we can rebuild a better world. Community foundations can play a lead and, and learning role in working towards challenging inequitable systems. Here are some big questions to consider and reflect on. How might we redefine the roles we have in relationship to philanthropy? Where do you currently see yourselves and where do we want to see ourselves in this transformation work? How can you as donors use your power and influence to affect justice and, and equity. How can all of us in the Vancouver Foundation ecosystem, whether we're donors, funders, community organizations, or community members, align together in our principles and values of justice and equity and work alongside communities to create the much needed changes to the complex problems in our society? And the last question I've been thinking of is, how do we advocate together in the example that Dara provided earlier, emergency food programs are necessary, yet a downstream example of systems change work. How can we address the root causes together of why people face food insecurity and create the upstream sustainable solutions necessary to disrupt these inequities? Vancouver Foundation funds community organizations to work towards positive and equitable changes in the systems we navigate. Here is your opportunity to actively participate in systems change as the Vancouver Foundation 
works to embed justice and equitable practices within the organization. This is emerging work and exciting work, and I encourage you to play a leading and learning role. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Cretion. I wish we could chat about this all day. I could definitely just talk about this all day, but I, you know, I just really want to say thank you once again for your insights and your honesty today. Uh, you know, I've I'm feeling really inspired by your words and motivated by your passion. I also hear your call for us to do better and to do this by working in, in service of systems change. Um, it's what we've been hearing over the years and, and hearing from community. And that's precisely why we're doing this work right now. We know that foundations like ours are uniquely positioned to reimagine and pave a new way forward. The Community Response Fund, as Kevin mentioned this morning, was an example of that. And I know that so many of the incredible staff and donors who came together to make this possible are here today. So thank you all for being here. And thank you for your ongoing trust and support. And so with that, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Kevin for some final words. Thanks, Reka. And I would also like to thank, uh, as a, by way of uh, closing, Natalia uh, for the welcome that she provided, uh, Eugene and David for the um, update on our investment performance, Dara, Reka, Christian, and Sarah for their uh, explanations and storytelling around our work in systems change, and, uh, and Mandy for running the show. And I'd also like to thank the hundreds of you who registered for this event. One of the things we've learned from the pandemic is that we can greatly expand our reach across BC by going virtual. And we look forward to gathering in person, but we'll certainly keep providing online options in the future. So I hope you're left with two overarching messages today. One is that Vancouver Foundation is a safe pair of hands when it comes to stewarding your philanthropic legacy. We offer world-class investment expertise and we're steadfast and prudent. And second, I hope you see Vancouver Foundation as a trailblazer in ensuring our collective philanthropy meets the needs of today. And it's a promise we've been making to donors over the past 78 years, that when a legacy is established with us today, you can be certain we will meet, meet the needs of tomorrow thanks to your foresight and generosity. We're rooted in community, we're listening and learning, and we're working with compassion to build healthy, vibrant, equitable, and inclusive communities across British Columbia. So again, thank you very much for spending some time with us today, and we look forward to carrying on our conversation with you for many years to come. Thank you.